In the entire 50 year history of BMW's motorsport or M division, there have been two standalone M cars. That is, cars that don't share a body shell with any other production BMW. Now the first of those came along in the late 70s. It was called the M1 and it was a mid-engine two-seater. Very sexy, very sporty. In fact, it embodied everything that the M division stood for. And now, 45 years later, and that's a fair time between drinks, there's the second standalone M car. And is it a sexy, exotic, racy little sports car? No, it's this, the BMW XM, 2.7 tonnes of plug-in hybrid SUV. I have so many questions. Let's lay out some of the facts first though. The BMW XM is absolutely loaded with gear and standard equipment. In fact, there are no extra cost options. Even the 23 inch wheel package up from the standard 22s won't cost you any extra. High-end fittings include front massage seats, heated seats everywhere, all the M badging and one-off styling, including the gold grille, the option of vintage leather, mega stereo system, and lots of connectivity. Price? Well, that will be a talking point because at $302,200, it's not for everyone. So what are the other major discussion points here? So I guess the most obvious of all those questions I have to ask is, what does this car mean to the future of M Division? I mean, is this what we can expect them to produce going forward? Are sports cars dead? Is the, the hulking SUV the new default performance car? Well, actually, the good news is it's not. And talking to the CEO of M Division, it soon becomes obvious that this car is a way of showcasing what M Division can do. At the moment, if you want to impress people worldwide, you've got to have a plug-in hybrid, you've got to have all-wheel drive, and you've got to have an SUV body. That's it. What does it mean for the big picture of M Division? Actually, probably not much. And for a guy like me who likes performance cars and sports cars, that's actually quite comforting. So viewed through that prism, that prism of this car represents what we think we need to do to showcase our talents rather than as a mission statement, where does that leave us? Well, look, the car is very high performance. It's got an electric motor and a twin turbo V8. Put them together, driving through all four wheels and an eight-speed transmission, and you've got 480 kilowatts and 800 newton meters. So yeah, it really can get out of its own way. One of the reasons this car exists is because, and not so much in Australia, but in other parts of the world, very, very, very rich people are going to be chauffeured around in the back seat. So lots of attention has been paid here. The door trims flow into the seat to make it like a sofa. The leather is beautiful, soft touch. There's plenty of leg room, plenty of foot room under the seats. USB chargers everywhere, dual zone climate control. It's lovely and it's beautifully put together into the bargain. The roof's a bit weird. It's a prism kind of design. I'm not sure what's going on there, but my favorite part is this. The M Division colors stitched into the seat belts. That's class. Underneath this car, there's a lot going on, obviously. There's a lot of thermal management in terms of the engine gearbox. I think there's nine oil coolers on it. There's thermal management for the battery system. And with all that horsepower, I mean, this thing can really, really scoot along if that's your agenda in a 2.7 tonne SUV. And obviously for some people it is. There's a lot going on in terms of suspension too. It's got springs that are made from steel. They're not air springs like a lot of these cars use. And there's an adjustable anti-roll bar system, which is very sophisticated, electronically controllable, and that helps keep the car flat. The one thing that does surprise me a little bit is how firmly it does ride. Uh, I've often criticized cars on airbags as having a pattery ride, but this thing on steel springs seems to have a similar level of impact harshness, particularly on small joins in the bitumen and, and manhole covers around town and things like that. You run over a cat's eye on the road, you know all about it. I kind of was expecting a car that was going to be a little bit more comfortable than this. The steering's very light. There's not a lot of feedback, but it's helped by having rear wheel steering. And that means that uh, you can tip it in with all that wheelbase. It will st still turn in quite sharply. It's quite, a, it's quite a fast steering ratio. And that might take a little bit of getting used to for some people, but it does make the car more maneuverable than you would expect. The other thing that occurs to me, even though this car has got 800 Newton meters, it is a very heavy vehicle and you can feel the gearbox stepping in to help you out. What that translates to is when you kick it down, when you want to overtake something or, or speed up quickly, 
it'll often drop more gears than you thought it would. You would think it would hang on to a taller gear and, and let the turbo boost pull it away, but it is such a behemoth, it will kick down a few gears, and that can feel a little bit strange. If you've driven a big, heavy pickup with an American V8 in it, you'll know what I mean. They're heavy too, and they use their gearbox more than a normal car of normal size and weight. But the upshifts, when you're just cruising along and shifting up and shifting up and shifting up and speeding up to the legal limit, that is absolutely fluid in this car. It's flawless. Okay, so I'm cruising along at 110 kilometers an hour now, which is the legal limit. The torque converter isn't really locked up yet. The, the RPM of the engine uh, is, is kind of irrelevant because at a cruise like this, if you've got enough battery power on board, the thing will slip into electric mode and just glide along. So now I've got the motor started, I've, I've given it a little bit of throttle, and I've got the petrol engine started, and the revs have come up to about 1500 RPM at 100, 110. So it's not raising a sweat. Electric range only is about something like 80 kilometres. They say about between 82 and 88. In the real world, it probably won't be quite that many, but it does mean that you can plug this thing in and charge it up at home and do all your running around for the day around the suburbs without using any petrol. The catch is this car will only charge off an AC uh, plug, a 10 amp plug or a wall box. There's no provision for it to charge from a fast charger. So don't go looking for a fast charger. As such, to take it from a flat battery to a fully charged battery, it's about a 25 kilowatt hour battery. That's going to take about four hours on a wall mounted box. So you need to keep that in mind. But for most people, that won't be an issue. And hey, it runs out of electricity, the petrol motor starts and away you go anyway. So you could drive it to Perth if you wanted to across the Nullarbor Plain. At this price point and with these lofty aspirations, you'd expect the safety angle to be covered. And of course it is, with every kind of safety device this side of a parachute. But the active safety stuff is the headline gear, with BMW's latest take on active cruise control with stop-go ability, steering and lane keeping control, automatic speed limit assist and active navigation. Parking assistance is also featured, which incorporates a reversing assistance function, front and rear panoramic camera views with a 3D view built in. BMW's connected drive includes an emergency call function in the event of a crash or other emergency. There's also an onboard tyre pressure monitoring system. BMW offers a five year unlimited kilometre warranty on the XM, but is also aware that battery life anxiety is also a thing. So the high voltage battery of the car is covered by an eight year 160,000 kilometre warranty. There are no set service intervals, the car works it out for you, but there is a BMW service package that is part of the purchase price and includes three years of roadside service. Right from the start, I'm happy to admit that for me, this car raised more questions than it answered. But I'm also happy to report that three ton SUVs are not the future of the M division. There will still be traditional M cars, thank goodness for that. We also learned that they built this car because it's a way of showcasing the M Division's talents to the people who are shopping at this end of the market. This is where the rich kids are shopping right now. So if it's not electrified and it's not a giant SUV, you've lost a whole section of the market. You have to be there, you have to be playing in this space. So that's fair enough. But that begs another question. Why go to all the trouble of the standalone body shell and all the engineering and development, and not to mention the money that's gone into this car, for what will basically be a one model car. Well, the boss of M Division said to me, what we tried to do with this car, one of its main mission statements was to poke people in the chest, was to make them think, question their perceptions of what a performance car is. And he said, he used the word provocative, this car has to be provocative. Well, I'll tell you what, I think we can all agree that box has been ticked.